Are we about to see the Ukraine war spill out into Europe and begin World War III? Well, we're going to see how a small breakaway republic may indeed be the theater for an expanded war. We're going to see who the major players are and stick them to the very end of this video when I'll show you exactly how to make sense of this crazy mess that threatens to engulf the world. You're not going to want to miss this. Greetings, everyone. Dr. Steve here with you. Great to be with you. As always, I'm your daily fake news antidote. So come on into your patron professor's den where I help you to think better so you can feel better and make sense of these crazy and turbulent times we find ourselves so if you haven't already done so you know what to do make sure to smack that bell and subscribe button before we begin as you know i recently retired from academia to go full-time here at turley talks fighting for freedom and bring the good news of patriotic conservatism to people all over the world but i need your support to help me keep my business going in the midst of all this constant threats from cancel culture so my team and I have created an amazing merch store with the best designs in the world, like the one I'm wearing that says, I did that from Bubble and Biden. We got some of the best Patriot gear where you can pick out something that spreads hope and supports my channel here at the very same time. So make sure to click on that link below. Get your Patriot merch today. These designs are punchy and fun, but they are not going to be around for long. So click on the link in the description below right now to both support me and spread Patriot hope far and wide. And I can't thank you enough for it. All right, gang, so let's dive right in here. My colleague, Conrad Franz, wrote an excellent piece a few days back. It's up on TurleyTalks.com on the very troubling situation arising from a small breakaway republic in the east of Moldova. It's a situation you most likely are not even aware of, but it actually could be the fuse that explodes into World War III. And Conrad does a great job of explaining it in that article. You definitely want to check it out here, which I will help to summarize. Now, if you don't know, the nation of Transnistria is a strip of land between uh, Moldova and Ukraine. About a half a million people live there. When the Soviet Union collapsed on Christmas Day 1991, Transnistria was supposed to become a part of Moldova, but the problem is, is the population Transnistria is hev heavily Russian, mostly Russian-speaking, while Moldova is dominated by Romanian speakers. And so Transnistria wanted to stay with Russia and Ukraine after the Soviet breakup, and they end up fighting a two-year war with Moldova to secure their independence. And it basically ended in a stalemate, or what's often referred to as a freeze in the conflict. And though 97% of the Transnistrian population voted to join Russia in 2006 in a uh, referendum, to this day, Transnistria's independence is not recognized by a single UN member state. And yet, they function like a fully independent republic. Transnistria has their own police, they have their own military, they have their own government, legislative institutions, you name it. And perhaps most importantly, Transnistria has Russian troops and a Russian military base to help protect it and keep the peace as a result of the freeze, the stalemate decades back. Now, several days ago, there were a series of explosions and attacks on Transnistrian government buildings. Now, these were the first attacks since the stalemate began in the 1990s. And as far as Transnistrian officials are concerned, they're blaming Ukrainian militants for committing the attacks. Now, the Moldovan government is blaming a Russian false flag for the purpose of destabilizing the situation on Moldova's border. And to make things even more alarming, the military map shows that Russian coalition forces are moving steadily along the Black Sea coast uh, around southern Ukraine. And if they take Odessa, which, by the way, is heavily Russian, that would, in effect, bring Russian troops right up to the border of Transnistria. And that's exactly what the Russian commander of Russia's central military district said. He said gaining control over southern Ukraine would help Russia link with Transnistria and defend them from these attacks. Now, here's where things start getting very concerning. Moldova claims to be a neutral nation. It's not part of a NATO. A NATO. It, just, it claims not even to have a military. But it is heavily Romanian. And the notion of reunifying with Romania is actually growing in popularity each and every year. The concern here is that with Russians possibly attempting to annex Transnistria, Romanian troops may get involved. 
And that's exactly what's being discussed among Ukrainian government advisors, that the Ukrainian army, along with help from the Romanian army, could take over Transnistria in, quote, the snap of a finger. And of course, if that were the case, that would pit Russian troops who are already there in Transnistria directly against Romanian troops. And Romania is, of course, a member of NATO. And with Poland, another NATO member, ratcheting up its rhetoric, sending in troops to Ukraine, it's very clear that we're seeing nothing less than another potential flashpoint for invoking Article 5 in the NATO Charter that would effectively bring us into World War III. So what's going on here? Why is all of this happening? And what are our takeaways from all this? First off, I think we have to understand that what's happening here is really a clash between three different dynamics that are emerging as part of a post-globalist, post-modernist world. And it's in understanding these three dynamics that I think we're able to get a handle of what's happening here. So first and foremost, what's going on here in this theater of war is all the direct consequence of globalization, which we often define here in this channel as a vast interlocking mechanism of technology and telecommunications that in effect creates a single worldwide political and economic system. And that's the key to globalization. Globalism isn't so much a civilization as it is a system, a single standardized protocol for politics, for economics, for human rights that was supposed to homogenize the various governments and economies of the world into a systemic whole. And the promise was that that would rid us of wars and conflicts and poverty and the like. The problem is that globalism also involved a dynamic known as deterritorialization. How's that for a term? Deterritorialization. Because globalization involves transnational, is a transnational system, it disembeds political power away from localized control, away from communities and districts and counties, and it recalibrates that political power into the hands of a few, a centralized political and economic elite, like the bullies in Brussels, for example, in, in the European Union. And so the massive backlash that we're seeing throughout the entire world against globalization involves nothing less than populations re-territorializing their political power, taking their political power back, as it were, from the hands of a political elite. And so in many respects, this re-territorialization is the key to understanding the new post-globalist world that's emerging all around us. But the key here is it's not simply that the world is re-territorializing, that's true, but the key in all this is that not everyone is re-territorializing in the same way. And that is where the mess begins. Because anti-globalization is all about how you re-territorialize your political and economic power relations. And how populations go about doing that is where all the disagreements kick in. Now, in the increasingly post-globalist world, re-territorialization is being worked out in three ways. Through what we might call a neo nationalist sentiment, through neo-secessionist sentiments, and through neo-civilizationist sentiments. Neo-nationalism is simple enough. It involves a renewed sense of national sovereignty, a restoration of the nation-state against the anti-nationalist forces of liberal globalism. So this is what's anima animating the MAGA movement here in the United States, or the incredibly successful government of Viktor Orban in Hungary, you know, boosting borders and the like. But this renewed civic nationalism is not the only kind of nationalism that's emerging. There's also what scholars call a new kind of tribalism or secessionist tendencies, where populations want to break away from the nation state and form their own independent republics organized around a common region, race, or religion. And this is exactly what we've been seeing in the Donbass region in eastern Ukraine and the breakaway republics of Donetsk and Lugansk, as well as, of course, Transnistria. And then on top of all of that, we're seeing the rise of what scholars are calling civilization states. And these are states that are redrawing their boundaries around these massive ancient civilizational spheres like the Slavic Orthodox world of Imperial Russia and the Sinosphere of ancient China. The rise of Indian nationalist India is also being compared to a civilization state as well. And so these three different ways of re-territorializing are not just redrawing our global map, 
but are in certain areas of the world, of course, clashing with one another. And to make it even more complicated, Transnistria would be a neo-secessionist movement that actually wants to hook up with and join a rising neo-civilization state like Russia. So there's all kinds of different outworkings of this. And the key is that this is precisely the world that we have to engage with. This is not the waning world of Western-dominated globalism, and I fear that so many of our leaders in D.C. and Brussels are basically living in the past, thinking that the old rules forged in a dying globalist world, where there's a one-size-fits-all protocol to everything, continue to apply this new, highly dynamic, diverse post-globalist world. The Harvard scholar Sam Huntington, I think, said it best to paraphrase him. When you see these diverse re-territorializing dynamics converge into a conflict, it's best to stay out of it. And ain't nothing good going to come from it. And it will only serve to suck up the whole world into one massive explosive conflict. And I most certainly hope that at some point the dolts in D.C. and the bullies in Brussels are going to come to their senses and figure that out. Stay out. Because as we're seeing in Transnistria, such political miscalculations could have some very real and very potentially detrimental consequences. Now, before you go, you will definitely want to check out my latest video I just uploaded on Elon Musk set to fire a thousand woke Twitter employees. You are not going to want to miss that. So make sure to click on the link and I'll see you over there. God bless.